when I was a kid, growing up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the 1980s, I thought life was pretty good. My friends and I went to school right on top of Mount Washington, overlooking the city, and we weren't playing baseball or basketball or having fun. We might take a moment to appreciate that, to appreciate that beautiful vista. Only later did I come to understand that skylines can be very forgiving. And at the same time, we were enjoying our childhoods. The city of Pittsburgh was going through a very difficult time. 200,000 jobs were lost in the metro area in just a few years. That's one out of every five jobs, gone in the blink of an eye and not coming back. The steel city lost its last steel mill in the 1980s. Hasn't had one since. The decline of the city was perfectly captured in a book called And the Wolf Finally Came. A lot of people looked at the situation, they moved out of town. Others resigned themselves to a state of decline. But some people, some people didn't do that. They chose to do something about it, to come together as a community, to do something about the problems they were facing together. My dad was one of those people. His name is Paul, and he's a city planner, and he was working for the city of Pittsburgh in the 1980s. So my dad, his colleagues, local business leaders, concerned citizens, and a forward-thinking mayor named Dick Caligiuri came together to act. And what they realized was that it wasn't the skyline that mattered, it was the streets, because that's where people live. They live on the sidewalks, in the parks, in the plazas, in the retail districts, on the front porches. That's where life happens. And the city, in some ways, is the original platform. It's OG technology. It allows us to collaborate, it allows us to communicate, to shorten feedback loops, to get more done. And that matters because that affects real people. That makes people's lives better. So they looked at the city as it was and tried to figure out how they could make it better. Ed Glazer wrote a book called The Triumph of the City, and in it he called the city our greatest invention for just those reasons. That's the kind of thing I'm sure my dad agrees with. Haven't asked him, but I'm sure he does. And on weekends, when I was just a kid, he would take my sister and me to sites all around the city so we could see the progress that was happening, so we could see the places that were being made better. His favorite, his absolute favorite, was a brownfield, a 42-acre island. Now, a brownfield in city planning means a site that is contaminated, but would otherwise have potential. And this island, called Hare's Island, only two miles upriver from downtown Pittsburgh, Hare's Island for decades had been a site for interstate railroads to drop off cattle and have them slaughtered. And the site was gross. The area stunk for miles around because of the smell. And when that finally ended and they left, the community was so happy to have them gone that this site just stayed barren and desolate for almost two decades. And all that was there were falling down warehouses and the occasional rotting animal carcass. But my dad and the folks that he was working with saw potential. They saw that they could make this something good for the community. People told them they were crazy. They said, that place is a God-forsaken hellhole. No one will ever want to be there. And your plan to put in housing and put in parks and put in mixed-use development, that'll never fly. Well, a decade later, this is that same island. Hare's Island was renamed Washington's Landing, got a rebranding campaign. <laughs> and they have housing, and they have parks, and they have restaurants, and they have a river walk. They have recreational facilities, and they even have modern, clean 21st century manufacturing that's brought jobs to the community. This stuck with me, this lesson of what could be done when people from different parts of society came together to make a difference, stuck with me throughout my life. And as I got older, I had opportunities. I had the opportunity to go to Harvard. I had the opportunity to play professional baseball uh, for the Los Angeles Dodgers and Atlanta Braves, their minor league systems. And then I went to Wall Street. <laughs> and let me say, Wall Street doesn't have the best reputation these days. Much of it deservedly so. But there are good people there, and there are a lot of things that happen there that are worthwhile. 
It was challenging, it was interesting. Uh, I lived through the financial crisis on the inside, and I learned a lot. But at the same time, something was missing. I wasn't entirely fulfilled because I wanted to do more. I wanted to give back. I wanted to, to see the impact that I was having on society, but I didn't know how to do that. And while I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the man on the moon speech that JFK gave over a half century ago. He challenged us to do the big things, to do the hard things, and to not shy away from them. So while I was thinking this, an opportunity arose, something I never would have expected. But first, before I get to that, the number 37. What does that mean to you? To people who work in healthcare, they might recognize that 37 is the ranking of the United States healthcare system globally. The World Health Organization ranks us one spot ahead of Slovenia, one spot behind Costa Rica. And for too long, this was our reality. This is why the Affordable Care Act was so necessary when President Obama signed it into law. And this is why I had the opportunity to join the team to make that a reality, to bring health care to the United States, to give us lower cost, better quality, improved access to care. I thought about it because it wasn't part of my plan. I had a nice life in New York. I, I had a, a girlfriend, a dog. I was happy. <laughs> but at the same time, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to positively impact millions of people. I just couldn't. So I moved to DC, started working, and really quickly started working on something called Blue Button. This is a health information technology initiative, a public-private partnership, and it's super simple. The idea is to give people access to their own health information, secure online access to the information that is rightfully theirs. And for too many people, this was really hard. So we came up with a format, and we deployed it for veterans in the Veterans Affairs Administration. And we were hoping 25,000 might use it. Well, millions did. Millions used it and it saved lives. We then rolled it out for senior citizens, and then federal employees, and then we partnered with companies in the private sector. So they voluntarily rolled it out to their beneficiaries. And now 150 million Americans have access to their own health information through this blue button technology. And then something else unexpected happened. I got invited to work in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy with Todd Park, the US Chief Technology Officer, to do something brand new, to rethink how the government does high-impact projects. We started off by calling it Entrepreneurs in Residence. We quickly changed that name to the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program. And the goals were simple, three goals. Save lives, save taxpayer dollars, and fuel job growth in the private sector. But what was different, what was unique, was how we went about doing it. We took these projects and we went out into the public, into San Francisco and New York and all over the country, and we asked people, is this something that you think you could do? Is this something you want to do? And we looked for the people who believed they were put on this earth to do that job. And we got 18 amazing people and we brought them to DC. And this is the other thing we did differently. We didn't ask them to change. We didn't ask them to become like everything else that had existed before them. We said, you're coming from Silicon Valley. And I use Silicon Valley as a state of mind, not a place. It's a state of mind that tries to do new and different things. And in Silicon Valley, in the startup community, lean startup, agile methodologies, short feedback loops, data-driven decision-making, those are all commonplace, but they're not commonplace in Washington, DC. So we brought these folks in, we partnered them with existing civil servants, and we said, do what you're gonna do, and show us you can make progress in months, not years, because we were hopeful, but there was no guarantee. We didn't know how this would work out. But it did. We were fortunate. And we had an impact. RFPEZ. This was a platform to streamline the procurement process. The procurement process that is so cumbersome and prevents so many small businesses from participating in the economy. They showed through A-B testing that they could make it simple and easy, and they could save 30% in the process. And we were talking about a federal IT spend, a budget every year of $80 billion. That's real money. Blue Button, which I mentioned earlier, was folded into this program so that we could 
have the talent to supercharge it, to reach those 150 million Americans, but also to improve the technology so that you could not only view and download, but you could also transmit this information to a trusted third party. That's very powerful, being able to make sure that your spouse or your family can see your information if you want them to. Being able to share it with a third party, an app or a tool that might help you better care for your own health and your own health finances. And finally, open data. The open data initiatives were launched in health and energy and education, finance and more. And they took these assets that had been sitting for too long behind closed doors. And again, it's important to note, this is not private data, this is community level data. And they made it available so that individuals and journalists and entrepreneurs and businesses could take this and create value. McKinsey and Company did a report last year. They estimated that there is three to five trillion dollars a year in added economic value that could be created globally by open data. Trillions of dollars. The opportunity is immense. We are in the early days of this effort, but we are incredibly inspired by what we've seen so far. And the principles underlying this all were to make government simple, to make it easy, to make it accessible. So we used plain language. We didn't use legalese or government speak. We used interfaces that put the user first. And while we were doing this, something else happened, a crisis. Hurricane Sandy hit the East Coast. It lifted roller coasters off the boardwalk into the ocean. It demolished houses. It left millions without a place to live. It impacted businesses and the economies it meant billions and billions of dollars in damage. And one of the first calls was made to the tech shop at the White House, to our team. And we realized we had this tremendous resource in these presidential innovation fellows. They weren't brought in to work on this, but they were eager to do so. They jumped at the chance. And what they did was frankly amazing. One of our fellows was embedded in the crisis center of a major tech company. Another fellow worked with high school students in New Jersey to mine Twitter data so they could crowdsource which gas stations had gas available and then make that information broadly available to the public. When FEMA and the Department of Energy saw what these fellows could do, they said, we want those. So going forward, we gave them two new fellows. And one of the things that they built is a platform that allows crowdsourcing of information around damaged areas. So you can walk down your street, take a picture with your cell phone, of a building that's been damaged, upload it to the platform, and then other people can come on and rank the damage in terms of severity. What does this do? It allows them to assess the damage in a matter of weeks, not months. It speeds up the recovery process for communities that are, that are hurting in the wake of a disaster. We've now taken this kind of crowdsourcing approach and expanded it. NASA is asking for regular people to help map the asteroids in the galaxy. The Patent and Trademark Office, uh, the Smithsonian Institution, is looking to preserve and digitize 39 million objects of our shared American history. And we're tapping into people all around this country to make that happen. Then another crisis hit, healthcare.gov. Different kind of crisis, but severe nonetheless. And Todd Park, the US CTO, sprang into action. And several innovation fellows did too. Greg Gershman, and Ryan Pedschotsrum, John Kemp, and Justin Grevich. You probably haven't heard their names before, but what they did was heroic. They saw a sinking ship, and they jumped on board. And they started patching holes as fast as they could. It would have been a whole lot easier for them to stay on the safety of the shore and shake their head and watch that ship go down. There was no guarantee of success, as a matter of fact, most of the smart people were telling them they were crazy to do this. They were putting their careers and their reputations at risk. But they did it anyway. And what did they give up? They worked 18-hour days, seven days a week. They missed holidays. They missed tucking their kids in at night. The sacrifices these people made are tremendous. And I think the story will be told. And I think they've made history with what they did. Because healthcare.gov and the exchanges managed to enroll 8 million Americans in very much needed health care. That's one million more than the original estimates prior to any problems whatsoever. And the fact that they turned this around in weeks is what made that possible. 
And that's why President Obama invited the fellows into the West Wing so he could hear directly from them about the ways they've been able to make progress in a large and sprawling government. He then convened his cabinet and he instructed every cabinet agency, every cabinet secretary, to take these lessons and apply them in their own agencies. Vice President Biden, just a week or two ago, said the Presidential Innovation Fellows have done something remarkable, quite frankly, extraordinary. They didn't do it for the praise. The praise was a side effect. And when we saw how badly needed these approaches were, and the good that they could do in short periods of time at low cost to the taxpayer, we decided we needed to expand. So we started something called 18F. 18F is a new unit only a couple of months old. And they've got two missions. One, to be that SWAT team when the next crisis arises, as it inevitably will. And two, to take to scale the projects that have worked to determine what's worked and how it can be spread so the benefit can reach more and more people. They're developing the open. They have an office here in San Francisco, an office in DC. They want to work with the people. This is digital government. This is 21st century government. It's a new way of doing things. You know, back in 2008, a presidential candidate with a self-described funny name and big ears implored us, if not now, when? If not us, who? And that's true, because the world isn't something that happens in the newspaper. It doesn't happen in Washington, D.C. The world is all around us. It's our experiences. It's us. And brownfields, brownfields don't have to be a 42-acre island in the Allegheny River. Healthcare.gov was a brownfield. Post-Hurricane Sandy, New Jersey, that was a brownfield. There are brownfields all around us. And if you look outside into the Tenderloin here in San Francisco, if you're in a classroom in the Bronx, if you're walking through the marbled halls of power in Washington, D.C., you have brownfields all around you. But it's up to you to make the decision to act. And that's what I've learned. That's what I've learned from those visits on Saturdays with my dad to Harris Island. That's what I've learned from Wall Street to the White House. Let's hack the brownfields. Let's work together, let's collaborate with one another, with people from different sectors of society, with different backgrounds and different interests, and work together to make change. Because Brownfield is not a destiny. If we choose to make it better, we can. We can lift these Brownfields closer to their potential, and in the process, if we're lucky, maybe, we can lift ourselves closer to our own. Thank you.